right, good morning, church. My name is Matt Lorenson. I'm one of the elders here. Thankfully, I got my dunk in Wednesday when it's 20 degrees warmer. Thankful for that. Sorry, Craig. Sorry about your luck. I am doing the scripture reading this morning, 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. The scriptures are as relevant today as they were back then. Amen. Okay. That passage was read at our wedding and is still holding strong today. Um, amen. <laughs> well, good morning, church family. Uh, my name is Tara. If you don't know me, I would love to meet you. I am on staff part-time here at the church, and I help lead the women's ministry. That was my husband, Matt, who read the scripture. He is an elder here, like he said, and he helps lead the youth. I also teach from time to time, more often on Wednesdays than Sundays. But just a reminder this morning, any time that I am up here teaching, I do so under the authority of our elders and in full submission to them, and that includes Dallas. Dallas is also considered an elder, in case you didn't know that. Um, but it is just a joy to get to do this, and I'm so thankful for the opportunities that you guys give me to do this. I'm very grateful. I am not an elder. I am not a pastor. I am just a Bible teacher, and to get to be that is, is an incredible blessing. This morning, I have the added privilege of kicking off a new sermon series. This new series will focus on the very well-known love chapter that Matt just read up here, 1 Corinthians 13. And this series is going to be titled, Love Is. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to be diving deep into this chapter and discovering what love is and what love isn't. But this morning, with permission and probably against all better judgment, I am naming this morning's sermon, titling it, What's love got to do with it? <laughs> got to do with it. Um, now you know why they never let me sing up here. Um, I tried to get Justin to do a little Tina Turner bit this morning, but he turned me down on that. Um, it was disappointing, still recovering from that. Um, and although I am not propagating the message behind Tina Turner's song in any way, I do think that it is a valid question for us to consider this morning. What does love have to do with it? We talk about love all the time in our little Christian bubbles. We talk about love all the time in this building. We are supposed to love the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our soul, strength, mind. We are supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. We're even supposed to love our enemies and bless those who curse us. We've been talking about that lately. And then Matt just read this chapter on love. And it ends with this bold statement that he said. The last verse says this, And these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is what? Love. I know that's a common verse, but have you ever really stopped to think about that before? I mean, faith is a really, really big deal. Faith is the means by which salvation comes, right? And hope... Hope is huge. Hope is what enables us to persevere. Hope is what gives us an eternal perspective. But the Word of God says that love 
is greater than both faith and hope. And I think that's for several reasons. I think that's because one day faith and hope will be made sight, praise Jesus. But love has always been and always will be. Love is it's such a big deal because it is the entire essence of who God is. We're going to read 1 John chapter 4 for just a second to, to help us understand this a little bit more. Verses 4 through 7, I think it will be there on the screen, but it says this. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. So who is the source of love? God. Everyone who, who loves has been born of God and knows God. But whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. God is love. It's not saying God has love. It's saying he is love. So love is not just an attribute of who God is that sometimes we see on display. No, it is is the very nature of God that affects and perpetuates everything else about who God is and what he does. It's the defining mark of his nature. God loves. And because he loves, if we are in him, if we are in Christ, we love too. There is no other way around it. And that's what the word of God says. If we were to go on in this chapter, we would read that we cannot love God and hate our brother. Because those two things cannot exist in the same heart. And sometimes when we read hard verses like that, our initial reaction is to water that down. (laughs) Rationalize that away. But sometimes I think we just have to take the word of God at face value. Those two things cannot exist together. So, to answer Tina's question, what does love have to do with it? Absolutely everything. Love has everything to do with everything for the believer. It is not a secondhand emotion, as she suggests. It is the primary mark of who we are as believers. If someone were to walk in here this morning wearing scrubs, that would be a defining mark that somehow they work in the medical field in some capacity, right? We would be pretty safe in assuming that. Or if I were up here this morning and I was talking about someone who had really bad language, I might say, man, they cuss like a sailor. Because unfortunately, that has become a defining mark for sailors. If you're a clean mouth sailor in the room, my apologies. You might have a reputation to clean up a little bit. But my point is, when the world hears or sees the word Christian, the very first thing that should come to their mind before anything else is love. Because that should be what, what characterizes every single day of our lives but unfortunately like sailors I think we have a reputation that needs to be cleaned up just a little bit but here's the problem I think some of us don't know how to love well because we haven't been loved very well now this is not an excuse for all of us But I strongly feel it is the case for some people in this room. Maybe you're here today and you grew up in a home that was not very loving. Maybe you suffered some neglect and nobody would know that about you because you don't talk about it. But you dealt with some emotional abuse, some physical abuse, maybe sexual abuse. And so because you haven't been loved very well, your definition of what love looks like has been tarnished. Or maybe you're sitting here in the room this morning and you've been surviving a marriage that has not been characterized by love for years and years and years. And you've been sticking it out. But that marriage is full of bitterness and resentment. And so your view of what love looks like has absolutely been trampled on. And so instead of emulating this perfect love of the Father, we have this tendency to emulate this less than version of love that we receive from other people. And so if that's you this morning, I think this sermon series is going to be so good for you as we dive back in and re-examine what genuine love is and what it is not. Or 
maybe you're here this morning, and if someone were to inspect your life, they would think that you're someone who loves really well. Because maybe you do a lot of loving things. But if they were to examine your heart, and my heart at times, my fear is that they would see differently. Because you see, some of us have this knack for doing all the loving things, all the right things, but doing them with bitterness and resentment and frustration and even self-pity in our hearts. We've tried to divorce the actions of love from the motivation and source of love, and it's not working. I think Paul, when he wrote 1 Corinthians, knew that that would not work. And so that's part of the reason why he wrote this chapter. You see, he wrote it to the church at Corinth. And the church at Corinth, they were really big on spiritual gifts. Well, some of the spiritual gifts. Some of them they wanted to place up high on a pedestal, and those were the ones they wanted. And then some of them they didn't care for as much. But they got so consumed with the doing of the spiritual gifts that they forgot about the whole reason to do them to begin with. And so Paul writes this famous love chapter to tell them about a better way. A better way. Say a better way. A better way. And I know Matt just read it, but we're going to read it again, and we're going to make some stops along the way. I'm not going to read the whole thing, just the first eight verses. Let's start with verse 1. It says this, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging playing what? Symbol. My apologies for everything that is about to happen next. Um, Have you ever heard a clanging symbol before? I just have many ones today. You're welcome. Um, I didn't, wasn't able to find the big ones, but symbols in a percussion band used on rhythm, they sound good with other instruments grounded out by voices. Symbols by themselves, clanging ones, not so good. What Paul is saying is this. Basically, he's saying, if I were to speak in the tongues of men and angels, if I were to stand up here this morning and deliver the most eloquent message that you all have ever heard, if I could do that, which I can't, but if I could unveil your minds to truths that you had never known before, and if you left here inspired and challenged, but if I did so without love, then this is what it would sound like to God and what it would eventually sound like to you all. I don't know if you can hear it in the back like I could hear it in the front, but it is not a good noise. It's like nails on a chalkboard. It's annoying. You just want it to stop. Verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love I am nothing or if I lead a life group every single semester and if I show up early on Sunday morning for setup and if I volunteer down in the kids barn twice a month and, and serve food on Wednesdays and if I tear down this stage every time we have to turn it down tear it down, but if I do so without love, then this is what it will sound like to God, and this is what it will eventually sound like to the people you serve beside. Verse 3. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. If I do the laundry for my entire family and put it up in all the drawers in the right places it goes in the closet, which is the worst part, can I get an amen? Yes. If I cook dinner every single night, or if I bring home the majority of my family's financial income and even find time to coach my son's little league team, if I take care of my aging parents and offer to babysit my grandkids two, maybe three times a week, but if I do so, to boast for my own sense of duty and I don't do it out of love, then this is what it sounds like to God and what it will eventually sound like to our families. Okay, I'm done. (laughs) Is that 
to clap because I'm done. I don't blame you. Um, so how do you know? How do you know if, if you were doing these things, if you were operating out of a place of love or not? Well, do your so-called actions, do your so-called actions of love match up with the characteristics of love that we're about to read in verses 4 through 8? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. And it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. That is what genuine love looks like. So our acts of love should be accompanied by those attributes of love. Peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, all those things. Now throughout these, this series, we are going to examine each of those things. But today, since I was introing the series, and since I've been known to be a little long-winded, I'm just going to dive into the very first attribute of love. And that is that love is patient. Patience. What a doozy that one is, right? Show of hands for everyone who loves to get stuck in traffic. Anybody? Maybe you're on your way to church, you're always running late, and then you get behind that slow car on that back road. That's a fun time. What about parents in the room? How many of you love to tell your child the third or the fourth time to clean their room? Like that's when the joy of motherhood and fatherhood really starts to kick in for you. What about when you go to a restaurant and the server... Uh, forgets to turn in your order and you got somewhere to be right after dinner. Ooh. Patience is tough. And I think patience is especially tough in the world that we live in today because we live in this fast food, iPhone, Google at your fingertips, next day Amazon delivery, praise the Lord kind of world. But it feels unnecessary in some areas, but the truth is Relationships will always require patience, always. And love is patience. Love is patient. The Greek word for patience is this, macrothumia. Now, this is the first time ever in my history of teaching I've ever referenced a Greek word. Um, but it's just because it really hits, this one does. Macrothumia. The first part of the word macro, it implies a long or, or great distance, long, great distance. And then the last part of the word thumia gives the meaning of passion. Think fierceness, think the word thermometer. So it's literally, the literal meaning of the Greek word is a long burn. It takes a lot before you blow, long suffering, long tempered. And then a more clearly defined definition of patience is the ability to endure difficult people or difficult situations without giving into anger or losing hope. I want you to pay attention to those two possible outcomes. I'm going to read it again. The ability to endure difficult people or difficult situations without giving into anger or losing hope. Maybe you haven't had very many good examples of patient love extended to you during your life. But if you are a believer in the room this morning, then the most patient love you could ever receive has already been extended to you. Amen? So the very first thing I want to remind you of about patience is this. Number one, God is patient with us. God is patient with us. And I know that that is simple. But I really think we have to, to accept that, to grasp that before we can even begin to extend patience to anyone else. Psalms 103.8, y'all, there's so many good verses out there about patience. I just chose a couple. Psalms 103.8 says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. Praise God. Lamentations 3.22 and 23 says this, Because of the Lord's great love for us, we are not consumed. That's a relief. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Y'all, you have a patient father. A patient father, and that gives me so much comfort. 
because if I'm being honest with you all this morning, which I try to be when I'm up here, sometimes I just get so sick of myself. You ever felt that way? So sick of just battling the same old sin tendencies I've always battled, sick of failing to trust the Lord when he has proven himself faithful time and time again, sick of having relationship issues, sick of losing my temper with my kids when they didn't deserve that. Sometimes I just get so sick of myself. And I just start to feel like, man, I should not be battling these things anymore. I should be further in my walk with Jesus by now. I should be more mature in my faith at this point. And then I start to bind the lie into the lie that if I'm sick of me, then God must be sick of me too. Sick of seeing me fail over and over. Sick of seeing me repent of the same things again and again. And see, that's right where the enemy wants us. If you have ever felt that way, that is right where the enemy wants you because that will cause us to back away from our relationship with the Lord. That shame and that discouragement we feel, that will seep right in there. And I won't want to pray when I feel like, man, the Lord doesn't want to hear from me anyways. I won't want to open up the Word of God or walk into this church building when I feel like, man, there are no more second chances for me. I have used up all the grace he could give me. I'm a lost cause. So look, if you don't hear me say anything else for the rest of this message, hear me say this. You may be sick of you sometimes, and I get that. But the Lord is never sick of you. He's never tired of you. You have not reached your maximum repentance allowance. Yes, yes, he may have seen you fail time and time again. But his mercy is new every morning. Praise Jesus. He is slow to anger. He is compassionate. He is patient. Now, we don't abuse his grace. We don't continue in sin that grace may abound. No. We repent and we turn and we do absolutely our best to walk in a different direction. But we do not let our human frailty bring shame and discouragement into our relationship with Jesus. No, we rest easy in the fact that our God is a patient and loving Father. Number one, God is patient with us. Number two, we show God's love by being patient with other people. So we receive it and then we extend it to others. Y'all, the reality is people are hard to love. Amen? People are hard to love. People are critical. Complainers. This is the easiest list I've had to make my whole preaching career. (laughs) People are critical, complainers, easily offended. Sometimes they're just annoying, lazy, arrogant, difficult to please, selfish, and the list could go on and on and on. But guess what? So are you. (laughs) And so am I. So if we want to live by this false standard of only loving the people who are easy to love, then get ready to love nobody. Because the truth is, it may take some people a little longer to get under your skin than others, but eventually, it will happen. It will happen, and when it does, we can't afford to cancel people like Dallas was talking about last week. I want to ask you a hard question. At least it was a a hard question for me to answer about my own life. If you look back at your life, on your relationships, specifically your friendships, have you been able to invest in deep, long-term friendships? Or are they always coming and going? Are you able to work through conflict, extend patience in the other party's direction when they let you down, forgiveness when they hurt you, or is it just over, canceled, on to the next short-lived friendship? Love is patient. Love knows that friendship is a gift from the Lord. And friendships are worth swallowing our pride over 
and extending a little patience in the other party's direction, believing and trusting in the fact that God can refine that relationship over time instead of just needing to cancel it and be done with it. I'm telling you, friendships are a gift from God. You will miss them when they're not, when they're not there. Don't be easy to cancel them. Be patient with your families, your spouse. Mine doesn't require patience, but yours may. Um, your spouse, your children. Be patient with your parents. Be patient with your aging parents. Now, I always love my family. I think that that is a true statement, that there is not a second in any day when I don't love my family. But unfortunately, there are plenty of times when I operate from a place of frustration instead of a place of love while trying to do loving things. You ever been there? You're doing loving things. You're doing the laundry. You're taking them to all their practices. You're, you're cleaning up. You're going to work every day. You're doing the homework assignments. You're doing all the loving things, but you're doing it from a place of resentment and frustration and even self-pity at times. And my, I'm starting to wonder if we might as well even be doing them then because you know what it'll sound like to our families over time? Don't make me get it back out. That clanging symbol, that is what it starts to sound like. It's going to be annoying to them. It's going to cause even more resentment. You may feel resentment, but then they're going to feel resentment. It is possible to be a great mom or a great dad in the world's eyes, and it be all about you and not really even about loving your families. Sometimes there's a heart change that needs to be addressed. Because you see, only love can fuel loving acts for the long haul self-boasting, a sense of duty, that may do it for a little while, but you will run out of that. Only love will last. So when frustrations start to mount, man, remind yourself, there's so much good truth in the Word of God about patience. It was hard to pick. Remind yourself of verses like this. Fifth, Proverbs 15, 1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Man, I need to put that on our bathroom mirror in the morning when I'm doing girls' hair left and right. Man, a gentle answer turns away wrath. Be patient with your coworkers. A Christian is supposed to be known for their love, especially in our workplaces. Proverbs 15, 18 says this, A hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but the one who is patient calms a quarrel. Man, may we be known as peacemakers in our workplace. Be patient with your church. Be patient with your church leadership. In my opinion, we've got the cream of the crop. Maybe I'm a little biased, but man, our pastor, our elders, our deacons, our life group leaders, um, just the people who serve in the kids' barn, our, our staff members, I think they're the best. I think they're the cream of the crop, but guess what? They are going to mess up. We are going to mess up sometimes. And when that happens, man, we covet their patience with us. When we mess up, thankfully I'm not speaking to any current situation. Hallelujah. I love that I can say that and be honest. There's no current situation that I'm speaking about. But a situation will happen one day. And your choices are to either leave and go to the next unperfect church that will let you down eventually or to stick it out with us, show us some patience, and allow the Lord to continue his work of sanctification in our church body. Be patient with your church. But in order to have this kind of patience in our families, with our friends, in our workplaces, in our church, we have to keep going back to the source of it. Not just once a month. Not just, oh, when we're running low. We have to continually, over and over again, be going back to the source of patience so that the Spirit can create within us something that we cannot create on our own. Number one, God is patient with us. Number two, we are then patient with others. And then lastly, number three, we show our love for God by being patient with Him. We show our love for God by being patient with Him. Now, this is one that we don't really think about. We think about God being patient with us. We think about being patient with others. But 
we don't think about having to be patient with God. And when we do think about it, it kind of doesn't sit right. Anybody experiencing that right now? Like, huh, what you're saying? It doesn't sit right because it almost seems like it implies that God has done something wrong, so we need to be patient with him while he figures it out and gets it right. That, of course, is not the case. God never messes up. He never makes a mistake. But sometimes he desires us to show patience even when there is no wrongdoing. Sometimes patience is not needed as a result of sin. Patience is just needed because God wants us to learn how to wait and trust in him while we do it. So if we love God and love is patient, then we will wait on God with patience. And to wait on him any other way without patience is a lack of love. The bottom line is this. God's timetable, and I want to say this gently, but God's timetable is God's timetable. And we can wait it out kicking and screaming in misery, or we can wait it out in love and trust with patience. Those are the two options we have. Our foster son will be, uh, he'll be one on Tuesday. One year old. I can't even believe those words as I say them, but he was brought to us when he was just two days old. Two days old, DCS came in his little infant carrier, and they set him on our coffee table, and then they left. And Matt and I looked at each other like, what on earth have we done? Um, turns out it was one of the best decisions that we have ever made. We're crazy about him. Um, but man, those first few nights, those first few weeks, even those first couple months, y'all, they were hard. They were really hard. We would put him in his crib or his bassinet or pack and play whatever method we decided to try that night, and he would cry. Oh, he would cry. And we were exhausted, and he was exhausted, and the more wound up he would get, the harder he would cry. He was not about to just let us put him in his crib and just sit patiently till sleep came. He was not about to just sit patiently till we came back in the next morning. No. He would cry. He would kick. He would scream. And so we tried. We saw him. We saw his helplessness. We saw him in that state. And we tried different things. First, we tried swaddling him. Praise God for the swaddles. We tried swaddling him and wrapping him in some security so he would feel more closely held and less vulnerable. And it helped. It really did. It helped. But then sometimes he would still cry. So uh, on, those, on those nights, we would play lullaby music on one of our phones, just set it up next to where he was sleeping, soothing music, hoping to remind him, hey, buddy, all is well. You are not alone. It is safe here. And it helped. It really did. But then sometimes, not as often anymore, but sometimes he would still cry. He would still get really worked up, and at that point it would be unusual, but we would still, on those nights, we would just literally go directly into his room, into his little crib, and we would put our hand on his chest to say, hey buddy, we're still here. I know it's dark, and I know you can't see us right now, but we are with you. We haven't left you. We're still present. And over time, that precious little boy he learned this incredible thing called self-soothing. Babies aren't born with it. But in the right environment, over time, in a trusting relationship with their parents, with the right resources, they can develop it. Waiting on the Lord, y'all, it can be really hard. And I don't want to diminish that because... It can just be so hard. And maybe you're in here this morning, and right now you are in a season of waiting. And you're waiting maybe to become pregnant with that child that you desperately desire. Or you're waiting on, on your spouse to come back to your marriage or to be invested in it again and to just even try to put forth some effort. Or maybe you're in here this morning and you're waiting on your wayward child to come back to their faith and back to your family, and it seems like it's taking forever. Maybe you're waiting on that promotion or that pay raise that you know you have earned. Or that new job opportunity that is going to fit your family's schedule better. 
and you've been waiting and you've been waiting. The thing is, waiting without patience can go down one of the two roads that we talked about when we define patience. It can lead to anger or it can lead to losing hope. And both of those are very dangerous roads to walk down. Anger, anger hurts people. It hurts people you love. Even though you don't want it to, even though you don't mean for it to burst out of you, it will hurt people. Anger creates distance in your relationship with God. Losing hope, that leads to self-pity. And I've been in that seat before. And self-pity will become a cancer to your soul. We have to learn to wait patiently on the Lord so that he can renew our strength. That is what the Bible says he, he does. As we wait patiently on him, we will get the sense of him renewing our strength. But at first, we don't know how to do it. So we kick and we scream. So we don't know. We don't, we don't have the skill. But just like we saw that helpless baby, the Lord doesn't see us kicking and screaming and be like, forget them, sick of hearing that. No. He doesn't do that. He comes to us, and he's so ready to teach us how to do it. And he swaddles us by giving us some security, reminding us of his past and present faithfulness, showing us little tidbits in our day, unexpected ways of the way he's still looking out for us. And it helps. But then some days it still gets hard, right? It still gets hard some days. And on those days, he will sing his word and his promises over our lives, reminding us that his plan is still good for us, even though we're waiting. But then, and it helps. It helps, but then some days... Some days, even though we've been doing good for a while, even though we've been trusting, trusting, sometimes we'll still have that really hard day. And it's in those moments when he just walks into that space with us and he puts his hand right on our chest and we have this tangible evidence of the Holy Spirit of God there with us reminding us, hey, I'm still with you. You may not see it. It may be dark where you're at right now, but I am still there with you. And over time, in the right environment, with the right resources, and with the most loving Father we could ever ask for, we learn how to soothe our souls and how to wait patiently on the Lord. Amen. Worship team, you guys can come. See, he comes alongside of us and he shows us how to do it, how to be patient. The last part of this message was supposed to be me giving you some helpful tips about how to be patient. And sure, I can do that. Um, create margin in your life. If you're going, going, going with no rest ever, you will explode. You will not be patient. Create some margin in your life. Memorize scripture on patience. There's so many good ones. Do things that feel silly at the time but will actually help. Take a deep breath before responding. Count to three before responding. Those things actually work. Pray for patience. And I really do believe those things will help you. But I also know that every person who walked in here this morning walked in with a different situation. And I don't know you specifically, but he does. And as much as I wanted to come in here this morning and teach you something that would help you, I know he walked in here with you this morning, ready and equipped, and he actually has something with him that can help you. He's not tired of hearing you kicking and screaming. He's not ready to give up on you. He just wants you to let him surround you with his love and his security. He wants you to hear him this morning singing his promises over your life, reminding you that he has good plans for you. He wants you to feel the touch of his hand. Or maybe you've never felt that this morning. Maybe, maybe when I say that, you're like, huh? Man, his presence is real. His spirit is real. And maybe for the first time ever, you need to ask him to feel that. That you want to know, even in the midst of your darkness, that he is there. 
This morning, would you do that? Would you invite him into that space? Ask him to teach you how to have patience that you cannot have on your own. May we become a people that are marked by the patient love of God. Where our friendships, our relationships and our family, our church relationships, where all of them are marked with such patience. May we live convinced of the answer to the question, what does love have to do with it? Absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. Man, if you are going through a season of waiting in your life, if you are going through a time when you could just really use some patience, man, this morning I welcome you to run to the source of it. He has it. You do not come to him to get more of it. Let's stand and worship him this morning. If you need to pray about anything, we would love to pray with you. But let's praise him because he is worthy of all of our praise.